technology grand round for 2021. Thank you so much. So I'm delighted to talk today about immunomodulation and cardiovascular disease, the lessons learned from HIV and COVID-19. So the next slide is my disclosures. I wanted to start a little bit, you know, how did I get involved with this area of research? So in college, I was super intrigued by HIV infection. I said I was going to come to San Francisco to go to medical school, and that's exactly what I did. As a student, I worked in the basic science lab of Warner Green in HIV, and this really stimulated a love of HIV and research. However, I was fascinated by cardiology. And as a fellow, this is when lots of young HIV-infected individuals were presenting with heart attacks, and this stimulated a whole line of research. So I want to start off with the description of the clinical problem, which was, I would say, towards the first part of my career, and then touch a little bit about the underlying mechanisms of this disease process, and then uh, discuss a little bit about the therapeutic trials my group has been doing uh, in HIV, cardiovascular disease, and COVID, and then finally touch upon some future studies. And so while today's talk, I hope, will be very streamlined, uh, I want to say for all the trainees out there, you know, life and research is kind of like this panda. You have lots of falls, and you have to love what you do in order to get back up on that uh, rope and keep on trying. So this is some uh, data from HIV. Since 1981, over 79 million individuals have been infected. Over 37 million individuals are currently living with HIV. And the death toll is high. 36 million individuals have died. And annually, around 1 million people still die every year. The statistics in the United States are a little bit different. There's over 1 million individuals living with HIV and 40,000 new diagnoses per year of which African-American individuals make up a disproportionate amount of over 40%. It's kind of crazy to think that just a couple of months ago that uh, we have been studying HIV at UCSF for over 40 years. So again, some background on HIV. These are the recent infectious disease guidelines. Uh, when do we start antiretroviral therapy? Of course, ASAP. What do you start? And this has evolved. So integrase inhibitor therapy is now first line, as well as a newer tenofovir, so tenofovir alafenamide. The goals outlined for last year were 90% of individuals diagnosed, 90% treated, and 90% undetectable. And so where are we about those goals? So we're close, but we're still not there yet. When we go back to cardiovascular disease, the first cases uh, were described in the literature back in 1990. And uh, if you fast forward now, 28 years later, this is a meta-analysis from circulation showing that individuals with HIV are twice as likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And in the past 20 years, the global burden of cardiovascular disease has actually tripled. So it's a significant disease burden. These are the take-home points from my talk today. So this population with HIV is aging. Cardiovascular disease will continue to increase in importance. So addition and aside from traditional risk factors, chronic inflammation and immune activation play a key role in this disease process. As cardiologists, HIV is a fantastic model of chronic inflammation that can be used to identify other therapeutic modalities for atherosclerosis in general. And also for my HIV colleagues, some of the understandings that we've gotten from these inflammatory pathways can potentially play a part in HIV cure. Some of these studies of HIV in the heart have paved the way for studies of new viruses, so AKA COVID-19. And I'll talk about some of the newer biologic and gene studies that my group is pursuing. So back to the timeline, I wanna to go to description of the clinical problem. And when I first started at San Francisco General, I spent a lot of time really building the infrastructure to perform clinical research. And this included kind of putting together a mentoring team uh, training technicians to do advanced imaging for atherosclerosis and building a cohort to characterize risk in cardiovascular disease in HIV. And so some of the earlier studies from our group and others show that HIV infection was independently associated with subclinical atherosclerosis. And this was also shown in terms of coronary calcium, non-calcified plaque, and CTA. And we know that it time for exposure to risk factors to get clinical events. And indeed, like, you know, several years later, this is one of many studies that have shown increased risk of myocardial infarction in the setting of HIV. This is a data from veterans with and without HIV infection, so we have 50% risk for acute myocardial infarction. That impact of HIV on risk was similar to that of diabetes and older age. And you can see a higher rate ratio even among younger individuals with HIV infection. 
So a lot of the initial work that my group did was really establishing this field of cardiovascular disease and HIV. So first studies of atherosclerosis, studies of heart failure, studies of arrhythmias, which I'll come back to, and um, pulmonary hypertension, stroke, um, and, and, and kind of some newer findings as well. So recently there have been uh, studies to look at HIV and peripheral arterial disease. And this is again done by the veterans group. I wanna highlight um, Jay Tang and Eric Szymski and also Rushi Parikh who are all uh, mentees of mine who are kind of uh, pursuing and, and building upon these studies in the nation, national inpatient survey to look at patients with HIV infection and peripheral vascular intervention, showing that more patients with HIV had these non-elective procedures although their outcomes in clinically appear to be similar. So this is currently um, being submitted at this time. Now the HIV population is aging. And this is data from the Dutch Athena cohort showing if you fast forward to year 2030, that over 70% of individuals with HIV will be age 50 and older, and 76% of those individuals will have cardiovascular disease. So with that in mind, it is critical to have special clinics to be able to focus on this uh, older HIV population. So I think Joyce had mentioned in 2005, uh, my group started the HIV cardiology clinic. And this has indeed evolved over time as the uh, HIV uh, population has aged. So it's interesting now that more than one quarter of individuals with HIV infection in San Francisco are age 60 and older. And so the Golden Compass is something that was started by Monica Gandhi to really focus on multidisciplinary care for the older HIV infected individual. And as part of Golden Compass, Katie Cantapio, who's one of the cardiology fellows here at UCSF, will be looking at cardiovascular risk factors in the special um, clinical setting. Now, the types of uh, each cardiovascular complications that we see in the setting of HIV has evolved. So before there was ART, we saw pericardial effusions. Then with protease inhibitors, this is when the reports of coronary artery disease um, were reported. And now we're seeing that individuals should be on integrase inhibitors. And this is when we're seeing more reports of arrhythmias and heart failure. And so when we look towards the future, there's now injectable regimen, two drug regimens, and potentially curative strategies. And how will that impact cardiovascular disease in the setting of HIV infection? So only time will tell. I'd like to now move on to some uh, investigation of mechanisms of this increased risk of cardiovascular disease in HIV infection. So remember early on in the uh, HIV infection pandemic that there was a huge association uh, between antiretroviral and cardiovascular risk. So I'm going to try to summarize a lot of work in just one slide. Um, but the majority of studies showed that increased exposure to antiretroviral therapy was associated to an increased risk of myocardial infarction. And this was due to exposure to protease inhibitors. Um, that is with the exception of one of the newer protease inhibitors called adizanivir, which has actually been shown to have a protective effect, maybe because of its uh, impact on raising bilirubin. Now, abacavir is one of the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and there are some studies that show an increased risk on current use of abacavir. So based on those studies, the recent infectious disease guidelines suggest that HIV-infected individuals who are at risk should either be switched from abacavir and switched off of protease inhibitor regimens. Now, I mentioned earlier that integrase inhibitor and these new uh, tenofovir regimens are both, are both now first line. And uh, there's been a large uh, body of literature to show they're both associated with high levels of weight gain. And so of course, you know, how is that gonna uh, shape cardiometabolic risk in the future? So of course, traditional risk factors play a key role in this disease process. This is just one of many studies to show that traditional risk factors are common in HIV infected individuals. And to highlight that um, some studies have shown that actually uh, HIV infected individuals lose more of their life years to smoking than to HIV, really uh, reminding us about this important modifiable risk factors. But along the way, uh, our group and others uh, began to really turn the focus away just from traditional risk factors and HIV medication onto HIV disease features. And this is some of the work that Jennifer Ho did when she was a fellow with our group many years ago, showing that advanced immunodeficiency as evidenced by a Nader CD4 count was strongly associated with subclinical atherosclerosis as well as clinical events. This has also been shown with detectable HIV viremia. It is associated with badness as you can anticipate um, both with cardiovascular mortality as well as general mortality as well. 
In addition, uh, further studies from our group showed it that cardiovascular risk persists in the setting of effectively treated HIV disease and that biomarkers of inflammation and coagulation, such as IL-6 and D-dimer, are strongly uh, associated with that cardiovascular risk, and they remain elevated in the setting of treated and suppressed disease. So really for the next uh, part of our work, our group really was uh, integral to defining that key link between advanced immunodeficiency and cardiovascular disease, that chronic inflammation persists in that setting, and it is strongly predictive of cardiovascular events. And these findings really led to a focus on inflammation as an effort for HIV cure. I want to highlight now three, uh, some recent studies that have broadened our understanding of HIV and cardiovascular disease, focusing on imaging, uh, access to novel cohorts and specimens, and biomarkers. As I mentioned earlier, imaging can be a great uh, way to ascertain preclinical disease, also kind of delve deeper into pathogenesis and to evaluate the impact of different interventions. And so fluoroxy uh, FDG PET is an analog of glucose. It, it gets taken up uh, preferentially by metabolically active cells, and it's been shown to correlate very strongly with macrophage infiltration in tissues. And on this diagram here, we have an individual with low FDG PET uptake on the top, and this is in contrast to an individual with very high uptake on the bottom. And so using this imaging modality, uh, we're working with Ahmed Tabakal's group at MGH, our team used FDG FDG PET imaging to look at both arterial inflammation and also inflammation of the hematopoietic system in HIV to look at the impact of HIV disease. So here is uh, some of the examples of the imaging we see on the top uninfected uh, individual. And in contrast, uh, the individual at the bottom is HIV infected and you can see that the lymph nodes just light up with metabolic activity. We found that all individuals with HIV infection have significantly higher hematopoietic activity compared to uninfected controls. And there's a nice, uh, this mirrors the degree of HIV disease control with untreated unsuppressed individuals having the highest level of activity. And also working with scientists using specialized assays for HIV persistence that can detect one copy, we were able to um, relate the um, levels of HIV persistence to this level of hematopoietic imaging, showing that HIV replication occurs in this hematopoietic tissues. So in conclusion from this first study, we found that uh, hematopoietic activity in the lymphoid tissues is significantly higher in HIV. It mirrors HIV disease activity, as well as some specialized markers of viral persistence. And this has led to a focus now on imaging as a way to assess the HIV reservoir. In fact, HIV causes, uh, is, uh, causes immunodeficiency via multiple mechanisms. You have here uh, hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow that come out to interact with the thymus. These then mature into T cells, which can interact with lymph nodes and then uh, infect CD4 T cells of the gut. And so I think what would be ideal is to use imaging to have a more HIV specific tracer and to be able to quantify the reservoir. And working with Dennis Beckford Vera when he was at UCSF, this is indeed what he went on to do. He developed an HIV specific uh, tracer, VRCO1, studied this in animals and then uh, got this through IND and um, is now studying in humans in the setting of HIV infection. This work has also um, been greatly aided by uh, my HIV colleagues who've developed a very staunch and robust tissue sampling program. So they've studied, uh, so the, the gold standard for looking at the reservoir is by tissue. And so they've done a significant number of both gut biopsies in the setting of HIV infection, as well as a similar robust lymph node uh, tissue sampling program. So putting these together, uh, working with Tim Henrich and Henry Van Brocklin, uh, we are radiolabeling um, this VRCO1 tracer with zirconia and doing kind of first in human studies and coupling this with these tissue assays of viral persistence. So you can see some of the preliminary data here, um, an uninfected individual compared to an HIV infected individual using this uh, radiolabeled VRCO1. And also uh, down on the body, uh, on the bottom rather, coupling this to tissue indices of the HIV virus there's a very strong and significant correlation of lymph node tissue activity of HIV along with the lymph node uh, uh, metabolic activity measured with this tracer. We'll be studying individuals at UC Davis. 
I'd like to um, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about sudden cardiac death, which I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So I'd say uh, this has really uh, been something that's been pioneered by Zian Sang. And uh, around 10 years ago, he was setting up a study of sudden cardiac death in San Francisco. And he noticed that the first few individuals were HIV infected. And he reached out to me to really um, start this whole line of investigation. So looking at patients at San Francisco General from 2001 to 2009, we found that uh, AIDS-related deaths shown in blue were very common, and that's not surprising. I think what was surprising was that WHO defined sudden cardiac death in HIV, as shown here in red, was more than four times higher than the general population. And of course, there were all sorts of unanswered questions you know, after the study. Why is that the case? And really based on that, uh, Zian's team has done an amazing job really diving deep into this phenotype and, and pursuing why this is the case. And so this uh, study was published in New England Journal just a couple months ago showing a very rigorous ascertainment of all deaths in HIV-infected individuals in San Francisco County, as shown here. There's extensive assessment with medical records and the medical examiner, uh, autopsy evaluation, toxicology, and adjudication. Now, these individuals on 47 were uh, presumed to be sudden cardiac death. And so here, doing a deeper dive into this, I think what was not surprising was that occult overdose was very common and more common in HIV-infected individuals compared to the uh, general population. Um, and this next uh, figure is a very busy figure, but to take you through it, uh, individuals with HIV infection at higher rates of presumed sudden cardiac death uh, compared to uninfected individuals. And they also had significantly higher rates of sudden arrhythmic death compared to non-HIV. And these findings are driven by uh, Caucasian men. I think what was amazing about this study is there's access to uh, myocardial tissue. And this is uh, showing trichrome staining to look for fibrosis in blue of individuals with and without HIV. Again, uh, individuals with HIV had higher levels of myocardial uh, fibrosis across the board. This was not a replacement fibrosis, but really driven by interstitial fibrosis. And there was a suggestion that um, the individuals with sudden arrhythmic death had higher levels of fibrosis. Uh, this didn't quite meet significance, probably because of the small numbers. I think perhaps one of the most interesting parts of the study that didn't uh, make the paper was this uh, work from Joe Wong's group at the VA, in which he designs these specialized nanostring uh, profiles to look for markers of macrophage activation, immune activation showing that the nanostring activity in the myocardial tissues was strongly related to fibrosis, suggesting that that is a mechanism by which HIV drives fibrosis in the heart. I wanna also go back a little bit to heart failure in HIV. So it is significantly higher, HEFCAP, HEFREF, probably from uncontrolled HIV infection. Some studies show that while well, maybe protease inhibitor therapy is, uh, contributes to that risk of heart failure, but the underlying etiology is really unknown. So the Heart Failure Network several years ago set up a study to really um, look at this, um, looking at the, the contributions of fibrosis, echocardiogram, and novel markers. So with this cohort, I want to highlight some work that uh, Nalini Colasso and Teresa Wang did, um, did with this uh, cohort. They're very interested in HIV infection and how it leads to kind of a leaky gut and chronic immune activation. And they wanted to look at the role of these gut metabolites and structural heart disease in the setting of HIV. So they did this in the setting of this heart failure network, studying echo, MRI, and gut metabolites, and interestingly found that the gut marker, TMAO, was strongly related to diffuse myocardial fibrosis and echo indices of this higher filling pressure suggesting that this is the underlying way that uh, HIV may cause uh, myocardial fibrosis and then subsequently later leading to structural heart disease. Uh, our group has also collaborated with many others to make use of novel specimens. And this is a collaboration with folks at UCSD with a special uh, cohort called The Last Gift. And these are individuals who are living with HIV infection but have pre-donated their bodies to science and so they get autopsy within hours after dying. Um, we've also been working uh, very closely with the team at UCSS, so leave you a rune, Amanda, on CT surgery to be able to collect uh, cardiac tissue specimens at UCSF. And uh, of course, uh, COVID uh, put a little bit of a stop in this, but now we are collecting uh, heart, uh, heart specimens as well as LVET specimens. 
So some preliminary data from this, using these uh, tissue specimens at UCSF, we found that we were able to get excellent quality uh, data for single cell RNA-seq. And this is some preliminary work that was done by Neil Chi, um, showing UMAP projections on an uninfected individual on the left and an HIV-infected individual on the right. You can see perhaps more contribution of the lymphocyte and NK cells, as well as less contribution of the endocardium. And so working with Neil's team, we're hoping to do a more molecular analysis of the underlying underpinnings of uh, cardiomyopathy in the setting of HIV. This will be a combination of HPSC studies as well as human tissue studies. And as I say, I think we have finally gotten funding for this. I also wanna turn back now to, you know, how do we calculate cardiovascular risk in HIV? I think it's not surprising that traditional risk factors do a very poor job of predicting risk. And that is, they were, you know, they were developed in non-HIV populations. And thus, if you focus on only known pathways for this risk, this may not yield the best risk prediction in the setting of HIV infection. In order to overcome this, uh, our group, so this is uh, working with Peter Gantz, Mark Segal, and Matt Freiberg, is doing one of the largest of precision medicine studies in HIV infection to really discover uh, protein biomarkers that are predictive of cardiovascular disease and mortality. So there's many advantages of proteomic approach. So unlike DNA, it can change with the environment and it can also reflect biology. Um, and then using this approach in other populations, risk scores have been developed that outperform current risk scores. So we have done a large scale proteomic study in the setting of this VA cohort to look at mortality and HIV. Um, we studied 1,500 HIV-infected individuals, 853 uninfected individuals. And uh, this is, again, a little bit hard to look at, but we did identify novel proteins that are associated with mortality. And here on the x-axis is the hazard ratio on a log scale, and on the y-axis is the uh, p-value from Cox proportional hazards. The dotted line is Bonferroni uh, level of significance. And here we've kind of done the same for individuals who have an undetectable viral load. So admittedly, these diagrams are really hard to look at. So I've tried to make it easier by showing a table of the top 10 prognostic proteins associated with mortality and HIV infection. So the protein names, hazard ratio, p-values, and biologic functions. You can see here that they target things like immunity, coagulation, methylation, the proteins in yellow are protective and the proteins in white are associated with higher hazard ratios. What's neat about this is you can look up a lot of these proteins and, and show that there are known therapeutic targets. So this could be interesting for therapies in the future. We looked at these proteins and modeled them against things that we know predict mortality in HIV, like uh, HIV RNA, CD4 count, and they still remain significantly uh, linked to predictive mortality. We also did uh, looked at time-dependent receiver operator curves to look at mortality outcome. Remember of these, the area under the curve, um, one is perfect sensitivity and specificity and 0 0.5 is no discrimination. So uh, our proteins in the model did quite well for uh, prediction of mortality, particularly in the first several years. And this was apparent in both the training and testing data set. Now, our group is also looking at proteomic predictors of heart failure and other outcomes, including diabetes, kidney disease, and peripheral arterial disease. And so we're still continuing work on this project. So I'd like to now move on to some different uh, therapeutic trials that my group has been doing in the setting of HIV, cardiovascular disease, and also COVID-19. So, we touch upon some of these things, but there's many things that come together to cause chronic inflammation in the setting of HIV. So antiretroviral therapy controls HIV infection, but it does not cure it. There's potential toxicity for antiretroviral medication. CMV is an important uh, co-infection uh, co that can cause immune activation. There's a, a downstream microbial translocation through a leaky gut, and then immune abnormality, abnormalities, all which come together to cause chronic inflammation cardiovascular disease, as well as other comorbidities in the setting of HIV infection. I think if you look at the general HIV literature, what's pretty amazing is that in a variety of different cohorts, so young, old, men, women, treated, untreated, these inflammatory and coagulation biomarkers are very strongly predictive of cardiovascular events, as well as mortality. And that's despite some of the huge variability in these biomarkers, like IL-6. 
This is some pooled data from three large HIV studies to show that individuals with the highest quartile of both IL-6 and D-dimer had highest levels of mortality as well as serious non-AIDS events. And this paper goes on to say, well, if we could lower those inflammatory and coagulation biomarkers, maybe this could result in a significant reduction in clinical events. So, you know, how do we go about doing that? Should we look at interventions that reduce inflammation in the general population? And that is, let's look at low-lying fruit. Should all individuals with HIV infection take statins? So if you look at the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology, they say, well, you could, people who are borderline at intermediate risk, you could consider HIV as a risk enhancer to tip you over that edge to start a statin. The European guidelines are a little more aggressive. And so they say that, well, you should start lipid lowering therapy in HIV infected individuals to achieve an LDL goal of around 70, which is someone at high risk. And so let's think about where individuals with HIV should be on this line. In fact, there is data from many studies showing that now the contribution of HIV to cardiovascular risk is indeed similar to that of these other very potent traditional risk factors. Now, this is work from Paul Ritker showing that in the general population, uh, individuals who have cardiovascular disease should all be on high intensity statin. And you can divide them out to individuals who have residual cholesterol risk and some who have residual inflammatory risk. And you know, where do we think people with chronic uh, viral infection should be on the spectrum? So I want to first turn to the residual cholesterol risk to, to think about that. So we know again from data in the general population that individuals who are on statin therapy, who can lower both their LDL cholesterol as well as their inflammatory markers, as shown here in red, those are the patients that achieve the most clinical benefit. And it's kind of crazy to think that back in 2005, we really thought the statins for atherosclerosis, that that was going to be as good as it gets. And it's kind of amazing to reflect on how things have really changed. So we know now, of course, that there's many uh, agents beyond statins that can lower lipids incredibly efficiently. So of course, I'm talking about PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, these uh, injectable medications, as well as silencing RNA uh, medications and clizaran, which are injected maybe just once or twice a year. Um, our group has done some initial studies looking at PCSK9 levels in the setting of HIV showing that there are higher levels in the setting of individuals who are co-infected with hepatitis C. In addition, these levels of PCSK9 really increase and go in parallel with IL-6. And this is some work that was done by Pyle Coling now some time ago. HIV-infected individuals, because of their higher risk uh, and because of potential drug-drug interactions with antiretroviral therapy and statins, this stimulated a proof of concept study that our group is doing with Amitalkal and Udo Hoffman at MTH. This is a PCSK9 study to look at the impact of aggressive lipid lowering in the setting of HIV, to look at the impact on arterial inflammation, as well as endothelial function and non-calcified plaque. And so this will hopefully be done in the next year or so. What about statins and inflammation? And what's interesting, if you look at the studies to date, um, they show that statin therapy in HIV lowers LDL cholesterol like you knew they would, but there doesn't seem to be a very, uh, there doesn't seem to be a significant effect on most inflammatory and coagulation markers. So this really makes you wonder if statins are going to lower the inflammatory pathways that we think are important in the setting of HIV infection. So I'd like to move now to this residual inflammatory risk side. And so, you know, this whole line of investigation was stimulated by individuals with rheumatoid arthritis who have very high levels of inflammation and cardiovascular risk. And the CERT study that was led by uh, Paul Ridker looking at low-dose methotrexate in the general population with uh, high risk for cardiovascular disease. So in interestingly, individuals with HIV infection were excluded from this trial. But our group was very interested in learning to see how lowering inflammation might uh, fare in the setting of HIV infection. So working with the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, we performed a multi-center study to look at the safety of low-dose methotrexate in the setting of treated and suppressed HIV infection, and to also look at uh, impact on inflammatory markers. So it was a uh, six-month study. And so here, uh, low-dose methotrexate lowered CD4 T cell count as shown in blue which is a bad thing. 
we found also the low dose methotrexate was associated with a more significant uh, decrease in CD8 T cell count, which is potentially a good thing um, because that is one of the targets for HIV cure. This is uh, seen uh, at week 24 and went away after stopping therapy. No impact of low-dose methotrexate at all on inflammatory markers and no impact on uh, endothelial function. So this is really one of the first uh, studies of immunomodulation in HIV infection. Interestingly, we saw infectious complications that were high in the placebo group of this study as well. We hypothesized the immunomodulation of low-dose methotrexate uh, may, be a, may be mediated through its impact on CD8 T cells. And kind of later that year, uh, the study of CERT in the general population came out showing no impact of low-dose methotrexate on inflammatory markers or cardiovascular events. So if you look at the inflammatory pathway, I've talked a little bit about statins that in uh, the target down here in the pathway. But the thought is if you can move further up in the pathway, you can have a more profound effect on inflammation. And so IL-1 beta is impacted by cholesterol, turbulent flow, hypoxia, and neutrophil extracellular traps. There's a monoclonal antibody to IL-1 beta called canakinumab. And in the general population, it was shown to significantly lower inflammatory markers as well as prevent cardiovascular events. It interestingly had a reduction in cancer incidence as well as cancer mortality, particularly in those with lung cancer. IL-1 beta may play a role in HIV disease pathogenesis. And this is that uh, uh, in animal studies, IL-1 beta is released from the gut tissue. Also, IL-1 beta plays a role in caspase-dependent pyroptosis on this chronic cycle of CD4 T cell death and inflammation in HIV. So our, study, our group has done a small pilot study to look at the safety and impact of canakinumab in the setting of HIV infection, doing immunophenotyping and also imaging. So we found that a single dose of canakinumab did not impact a CD4 T cell count or viral load. Um, interestingly, there was a significant reduction in both IL-6 and CRP. No impact on T cell activation with the exception of CCR5 expressing monocytes. And there was a significant reduction in both arterial inflammation as well as bone marrow activity. So Sulbi Lee, who's one of my uh, colleagues here at UCSF and colleagues at Case Western Reserve, looked at gene expression after the single dose of canakinumab showing that it impacts inflammatory gene expression, as well as reduces some inflammatory pathways as well. So I hypothesized that uh, canakinumab could impact the bone marrow directly. There could be an impact on uh, arterial inflammation, as well as the ability of monocytes to produce inflammatory cytokines. You know, what about other agents that might be able to lower inflammation, like colchicine in the general population that has been studied? Um, there's been a small study in HIV out of Hopkins to look at this, showing that uh, colchicine did not seem to really impact inflammatory markers or systemic endothelial function. So I want to talk about, you know, clearly there's many different agents that are being developed to lower inflammation that are coming out all the time. And recently, Paul Ritker is now studying an IL-6 uh, agent called Ziltavecumab, which among individuals with kidney disease and inflammation showed really profound reduction in CRP. And so, of course, his group is now doing an outcome study looking at Ziltavecumab um, in the general population with kidney disease. So studies of cardiovascular disease I present in the setting of HIV can also be useful to inform the larger population with coronary disease. And that is, you know, we know from Peter Libby's work and many others that both innate immunity and adaptive play immunity play a role in atherosclerosis. And from our studies in HIV, we hypothesize that IL-1 beta inhibition may impact the monocytes and innate immunity, while low-dose methotrexate uh, may have an effect on CD8 uh, T cells and adaptive immunity. I want to point out that these were things that were learned from our studies of HIV-infected individuals, and they were not previously described in the uninfected population. And if you remember for atherosclerosis in general, in the general population, you have monocytes, macrophages interacting with the endothelium, causing occlusive thrombosis. In the general population on the left, um, coronary disease in the HIV population on the right, um, clearly there's going to be many overlapping pathways. 
the HIV population is incredibly well engaged. They love to do studies. And these studies in HIV can really help us learn more about the role of the immune system in cardiology in general and cardioimmunology as we move forward. So I want to also focus on these therapies that reduce inflammation in HIV. Can they have some role in HIV cure? And that is, we know that in HIV infection, there's immune activation, tissue damage, fibrosis, and this is a vicious cycle leading to poor, poorly controlled HIV disease. And so it can be a chicken or egg thing. So if you think inflammation causes viral persistence, lowering inflammation can help cure, and vice versa. If it's HIV persistence that's causing the inflammation, then curing HIV will get rid of the issue. And in fact, um, there's many individuals and groups who are studying this at different points in this pathway. Uh, some looking at gut uh, inhibitors, uh, low-dose methotrexate, JAK statin inhibitors. Uh, working with Tim Henrich, the AIDS clinical trials group, and our group also has studied the role of sirolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor, showing some interesting reductions in uh, CD4 positive T cell associated DNA. Looking forward, we will also be looking at latermovir, which is a CMV therapy as a means to reduce inflammation in HIV. And indeed, I talked a little bit about IL-1 beta earlier, and this is a study from Rafiq Sekali showing that IL-1 beta is strongly associated with the levels of the HIV reservoir. So our group is currently looking at the impact of canakinumab on the HIV reservoir as well. And this is a work that was led by Megan McLaughlin, who's a cardiology fellow here at UCSF. And she showed really for the first time that these specialized assays of the HIV reservoir in HIV were strongly and independently associated with development of incident plaque. And so this again suggests that you know, different therapies that target the HIV reservoir could also be helpful in reducing cardiovascular risk in HIV infection. So I think uh, today I've talked a little bit about, you can, you can like look at it as a tree diagram. So HIV reservoir are the roots of the tree, monocytes, macrophages make up the kind of the trunk of the tree, inflammation are these branches and the leaves is kind of cardiovascular disease. And so I've kind of, you know, I think we have to acknowledge in reality, it could be much more complicated than what I'm presenting. So I wanna now uh, turn a little bit to COVID-19 studies. And so of course, last year was a crazy year and it was, our group was able to apply a lot of our expertise in HIV to pivot and study COVID-19. I love this quote from Tony Fauci that says, everything we learn from different pathogens spins off of HIV infection. So I'm gonna present uh, two uh, studies that our group was involved in, both cold corona and can COVID. I'm not gonna have time to present some work that I've done with Annie Lukemeyer on convalescent plasma. And this picture on the right is a reminder of, I think what I was doing at this time last year, which is uh, working with nursing to help consent patients through the door. And I'm just really thankful for the partnership in all these studies that was really critical. So cold corona, was an outpatient study to look at upstream uh, intervention with colchicine to see if giving it early on would reduce subsequent uh, COVID deaths and admissions for COVID. So it was a very unique kind of contactless consent form and delivery of medication to the door. Now this was an incredibly challenging study to enroll at UCSF, which I can go into other reasons why, but long story short, did not show an impact on outcomes. There's probably several reasons for this. Um, at the beginning of the study, they did not require a COVID positive test to be in the study. And if you uh, then limit the analysis to patients who were indeed COVID positive, there was a positive association between colchicine therapy and reduction in hospital admission and death. And so this was also a very short follow-up period of only 30 days. What about giving uh, more uh, uh, inflammation lowering agents in the hospital. And this is looking at canakinumab in the setting of hospitalized individuals. And so this study was a little bit easier for us to enroll at UCSF. Again, long story short, uh, IL-1 beta inhibition given in the hospital didn't seem to reduce outcomes. But again, this study was done really early on the COVID pandemic. I want to point out that although it was prohibited, a lot of individuals were treated with other IL-6 and IL-1 agents if you exclude those individuals per protocol, there was a significant impact of canakinumab on outcomes as shown in this diagram. So the group at UCSF have really pivoted to look at um, study HIV to COVID sequelae. 
And this is a work that was done by Michael Peluso, Dan Kelly, and many others that have now enrolled over 300 individuals with COVID. They have incredible phenotyping and follow-up as well. So after the acute COVID pandemic, there's been lots of reports now of persistent symptoms and cardiopulmonary symptoms after acute infection. And in fact, studies have shown that, this, uh, that these symptoms are very common. They cross organ systems and they are associated with increased risk of death. And in fact, uh, COVID persistent cardiopulmonary symptoms have been uh, demonstrated in this link cohort um, locally. And you can see they persist out to 28 to 38 weeks. So with this in mind, Matt Dersenfeld, who's a junior faculty here, really jumped on this to look at the cardiovascular uh, implications of COVID-19 with this uh, study. And some of Matt's preliminary work is super interesting, showing that persistent antibody levels of COVID, as well as inflammatory markers, namely CRP, are strongly associated with persistent symptoms, as well as pericardial effusions. So you can try to think of a, a, a possible mechanism by which uh, you know, COVID has tissue infiltration and immune cells. This leads to higher antibodies, higher inflammation, and persistent cardiopulmonary system symptoms. Matt's currently doing a more deeper dive with uh, additional testing on this as well. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this, uh, but this is a study done in HA uh, that Matt has led, showing that individuals who are hospitalized with HIV and COVID seem to have uh, not worse outcomes compared to the general population. This was just accepted for publication, so congrats on that. So we think that UCSF will be part of a national uh, long COVID study called RECOVER. And as part of that, we are aggressively pursuing proof of concept interventional studies to be able to reduce symptoms. Uh, some of the therapies we're discussing could be antiviral strategies, monoclonal antibodies, um, uh, JAK kinase inhibition, and others. So we're very interested to begin some of these studies uh, in the future. I want to now go into the last part of my talk, which is kind of an evaluation of future studies with my group. So I want to circle a little bit back to HIV cure. You know, why is that needed? I mentioned at the beginning that there's around 38 million individuals with HIV infection, and two have been cured. So clearly, uh, despite good medications, there's a large amount of individuals who are not on treatment who are not um, undetectable. And so there's two different strategies for cure. You can completely get rid of the HIV reservoir, and that would be a permanent cure. Or you can try to um, achieve remission, which is reducing the reservoir and then manipulating the immune system on the right-hand side. So Steve Deeks's group has done some of the first work looking at chimeric antigen receptor T cells as a means to eliminate HIV now almost 20 years ago. And shortly after, there was a work modifying these T cells to protect against HIV infection using a lentiviral vector. And more recently, these, uh, these two methods were combined uh, to use duocar approach along with lentiviral vectors in a mouse model. So in this mouse model, they showed that this uh, duochimeric antigen receptor T cell um, after HIV infection was associated with significantly lo lower levels of the HIV virus and the reservoir. And we're very excited to work with Steve's group to do first in human duo CAR T cell therapy and treated and suppressed individuals. This work is funded by the California Institute for Genitive Medicine. And you can appreciate the study design here. There will be uh, arms that include lymphodepletion and incredible long-term follow-up of 15 years. So I'm learning a lot in doing this study and there's incredible monitoring that's required for this. Uh, the patient has to have a partner and they have to be monitored 24 hours for four weeks. Neither individual can drive and neither individual can work for that time. So think about how hard it is to, it's gonna to be to perform this study. Our group is also gonna be involved in some in vivo gene editing for HIV cure studies. Um, several years ago, some initial work done to eradicate the provirus. More recent work then excising the integrated virus from human cells. Um, using this in a mouse model, and more recently um, using an uh, adeno-associated viral vector and CRISPR-Cas9 editing in human primates. And I'm excited to say last month the FDA cleared uh, first in human studies using this approach. 
So again, with Studio's group, we will be doing this first in vivo gene editing, which has an incredibly intensive uh, protocol as shown here. Uh, they have to have daily blood draw, they must be hospitalized, and there's a 15 year follow up. I just want to reflect on these uh, as a non oncologist doing this gene and cell based therapy. Uh, there's lots of challenges. You know, all of these protocols were kind of built in the context of fetal disease, requiring intensive monitoring and monitoring for decades. And I have to think about as a cardiologist when we start to do um, these types of studies for non fatal diseases like lipid lowering, like heart failure. How are we going to adapt this type of monitoring? And that's going to be something that we're going to have to face. You know, our group is really trying to build the infrastructure to do these cutting edge gene studies, biologic studies at UCS Step. And this will be not only in the setting of cancer, but other disease states, really building off the infrastructure of the Living Therapeutics Initiative that's uh, being developed at UCSF. So finally, I want to just uh, touch upon some new collaborations um, that are going on. And this is a uh, work from Diane Havler's group and the search study, which is this incredible 32 rural communities in uh, Africa looking at testing and treating for HIV infection. She just uh, got this grant renewed and the second iteration of this grant will look at cardiovascular disease and comorbidities. And I'm super excited to be part of this. I hope that this collaboration will lay the groundwork to really grow uh, global cardiology at UCSF. And finally, in the last several minutes, I wanna highlight some work done by uh, cardiology fellows and mentees. This is Angela Thakar, who's in built an incredible database of 18 years of data at San Francisco General, looking at the implications of meth use on readmission and mortality. She's also studied a novel marker called angiopotin in the setting of HIV, and this was just accepted for publication. Uh, also, uh, our group is looking at the mechanisms of methamphetamine-associated heart failure, and Emily Cedarbaum is now leading this, and this was started by Teresa Wang, um, doing some advanced imaging and characterization using ECHO to do this. We're, of course, uh, greatly aided in this process by Jonathan Davis and his uh, is Heart Plus Clinic as well. And then finally, I mentioned a little bit about the role of the hematopoietic system in HIV infection. We know that now clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential is a very strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease uh, in the general population. So our group is looking at the role of HIV infection and CHIP, also uh, CHIP and imaging of the hematopoietic system and the impact of canakinumab on CHIP in HIV. And so Katie Cantafio here is taking over this study. We're working with Alex Bick and also Pradeep Nadarajan. So in summary, I've talked a little bit about cardiovascular disease and HIV. I talked about the different, differential impact of two different anti-inflammatory strategies. Hopefully some of these questions can inform cardiovascular disease in the general population, and we can apply some of these studies to studying new viruses like COVID-19. So in this summary slide, I think we've touched upon many of the different things on this pathway that can go from HIV infection to cardiovascular disease, traditional risk factors, HIV medication, HIV curative strategies, and other anti-inflammatory strategies. I've also tried to present lots of gaps. You know, we don't know the safety, a lot of these approaches. Um, how do we you know, move the field forward? And a nice clinical statement on HIV and cardiovascular disease was led by Matt Feinstein, who's uh, one of my colleagues and mentees at Northwestern. And I want to also highlight the importance of training future investigators to do uh, different types of cardiovascular disease and HIV research in the SHE K-12 program that's led by Florence Long and myself. I finally just want to close by thanking uh, my incredible research team uh, here at UCSF and all my collaborators and want to thank, uh, just open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, that was wonderful, Dr. Shu. Um, please, if you guys have any questions, please add them to the Q&A uh, chat box or even in the chat window and we'll get to them. Um, we have a couple of minutes left over. So I have a question from um, Dr. Vera about the autopsy study that found increased myocardial fibrosis in HIV patients. Did this study or has any study tried to correlate CD4 count with the amount of myocardial fibrosis? Yeah, so there have been some uh, imaging studies using cardiac MRI and um, looking at fibrosis using that uh, modality. And that 
Most of those studies, though, have focused on patients with well-treated HIV disease, so they haven't looked at untreated individuals. So I'll say it's still a little unanswered, um, but I think in, in ZN studies, you know, it included, it included all individuals with HIV treated and not. And so definitely, you know, tried to look at the impact of CD4 count viral load that was measured ahead of time. But it seems to be apparent in all types of HIV, despite the level of disease control. Interesting. I, I was similarly wondering if there has been any studies looking at LV strain as a, a bit of a more accessible imaging modality for these patients. Yeah. Yeah, I think there have been uh, some uh, cohorts looking, not linking strain and fibrosis, but uh, some studies looking at, you know, worsened assessments of strain. And for sure, in that heart failure network study that was led by Sanjeev Shah, so for sure, um, they've tried to look into it. Interestingly, strain was not related to myocardial fibrosis in that study that I presented in the heart failure network. But a lot of those patients, uh, they did not have clinical heart failure, so they were not symptomatic. So it'd be interesting to look at individuals who have worsened heart failure and are further along in their disease state. Interesting. Um, I have a question from Dr. Alan Bake. So he says, amazing talk. Uh, what is the CAR-T targeting for HIV study? Are there concerns for on or off target effects? And given the association with inflammation and in HIV, are these patients more at risk of immune related adverse effects after immune checkpoint inhibitor, ther inhibitor therapy? Yeah, those are great questions. And I don't have answers to a lot of those. So it is, um, it's the, it's, the T cells in HIV. So we take the T cells out of the body, they get the chimeric, they get the duochimeric antigen receptor, and then they get infused back into the body. Certainly, whenever you do that, there's going to be the possibility of off-target effects. And that's why we have to, you can imagine we have to monitor patients for 15 plus years. So I think that's a fascinating question about checkpoint inhibitors in the setting of HIV. I have to say, I have not seen any study to look at that. So, but I, I think it could be, maybe it's like dual, dual inflammation and immune hits in that process. So, and that's a great question. For sure, we should be able to look at that locally or in other cohorts. I was wondering um, in our last few minutes, if you could talk a little bit about your experience or lessons learned, especially during the pandemic with a lot of the randomized controlled trials that you've been doing um, surrounding uh, COVID-19. Yeah, um, you know, I have to say it was, uh, it was hard to do some of these studies and uh, I'm trying to see what I, what's okay for me to say and what's, what's not okay. I think Part of it is just learning from our patients. So the, the outpatient study with colchicine, I thought was gonna be really easy to enroll, uh, but it turns out a lot of our patients don't speak English, they don't have access to email and they don't have a cell phone. So that was an immediate like barrier to like the majority of our patients. And so I think it's really important to, you have to know your patient population. The second thing, which was a little challenging is that we had local kind of concerns about safety of colchicine that required additional monitoring at UCSF that was not required at any of the other sites, which made it really challenging to enroll. So it just makes you, uh, it's really hard to do hands-on patient research. But there are, so I think some of the other studies like canakinumab, it was a lot easier to do because the patients, they were inpatients. And so we had kind of a we had a, a captive audience, as you may, of patients to build and enroll. So we actually enrolled like gangbusters for canakinumab. And interestingly, UCSF does very well in these smaller, very intensive uh, HIV studies like the CAR T cell and in vivo teen editing. I do not anticipate we're gonna have problems enrolling for that, just given the track record of the group here. But there's, there's some studies that are easy to do and there's some studies that are hard to do. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I think Dr. Shu has his, her email available if anyone has further questions. Um, but thank you all for attending and uh, we'll see you next week. Great. Thank you.